government house where we were sworn... I would hope that probably it would be my upbringing that helps me connect rather than necessarily my age. I hope when I'm a you know 50 year old woman that I have still the same level of empathy and compassion that I have as a 37 year old woman. The first thing that um, that I remember being very aware of um, is that, and I was small, so I didn't frame it in terms of equality. I just saw children that didn't have what I did and questioned why that was. It took me a few more years to then realise that actually, if you want to change, you know, if you want to change the world, as it were, the politics is is the place that you make those significant changes. It's not the only place, but it is probably the most effective. Growing up, my sister and I were the only Mormon kids my age that, that were at my school. So in part, um, it was a very strong part of my identity. It was how my friends identified me as well. Um, I was both Mormon and, and sober driver. That was, <laughs> that was the benefit that they saw from my, um, from my membership. There'll be often times where, where I don't have the same view as those who are around me, but what I learned was always to respect the perspective of someone else, understand where that view has come from and why. And it's changed, you know, that probably has made me the politician I am. New Zealanders are deeply concerned, not just about what is happening to our country, but what is happening to our people. I made the, the move to follow Obama on Twitter. And I remember thinking, why am I following Obama on Twitter? And it was because I was hoping to get some kind of insight into this um, uh, world leader. Uh, and it made me realise that, of course, it will always be important that people understand the politics and the drive and the policy direction of our, of our leaders, but they also deserve to have a sense of who they are. So I see social media as a way of, yes, giving people that insight into who you are um, and to a certain degree the life that you lead. I know that one of the issues that we have both here in New Zealand and much more broadly is that women's um, confidence in themselves to do a job can be a barrier um, as alongside many of the other very real barriers that exist in the workplace but I know that is a barrier as well and if I can give a sense of hope that there is a path that you can find yourselves in these wonderful situations uh, if you push ahead and hold a bit of self-belief in your ability to do a job. It's a simple message but I hope one that, that just my presence conveys. We have a housing crisis. Um, we have not built the infrastructure we need. We need to do that so that we don't offer a false dream to those who make an extraordinary effort to lift and upheave their lives to come here. So I really push back on this idea that, um, or this sentiment that somehow making sure that we have the right structures and the right system in place is anti-immigration. It's about making sure that New Zealand can uphold its reputation of being a place that when people choose to settle here, have a decent life and a good life, because that's what my ancestors had. Well, uh, quite a change from uh, Jeremy Corbyn last week. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. My name is Tom Switzer. I'm here from the Centre for Independent Studies. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you all here today. Last week we discussed with um, Eamon Butler from the Adam Smith Institute about the threat that Jeremy Corbyn had posed or is posing to uh, the body politic in Britain. Well, today we're going to be talking about the, um, the new Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinta Ardern, and the extent to which her new uh, minority government of Labor, Greens and New Zealand First, to what extent that threatens New Zealand prosperity. <laughs> I can't think of a better person to talk about New Zealand politics than our guest today. Uh, Oliver Hartwich is no stranger to many of you. He was for several years a senior fellow here at the Centre for Independent <laughs> Studies. Uh, these days, he's the executive director of the New Zealand Initiative, a bit like our sister think tank across the Tasman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Oliver Hartwich. Um, Oliver, 
uh, the centre-right national government of Prime Minister John Key and uh, Prime Minister Bill English. They presided over uh, Bill English. From two they presided over uh, Bill English. From two they presided over <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Bill <laughs> From 2008 until about 2017, 3% economic growth, mm -hmm. budget surpluses, 4.8% uh, unemployment, Yet they lost power. Why? Well, I think uh, for an Australian audience, uh, perhaps the best parallel I could come up with is why did John Howard lose power? <laughs> um, John Howard was also, uh, I think, arguably um, one of Australia's most successful prime ministers, presiding over some similar figures even and repaying debt, and he was still kicked out by Kevin from Queensland. Yes, but and, and to be fair, though, John Howard, the, the prevailing wisdom is that he stayed too long as... 12 years as Prime Minister, John Key defied Enoch Powell's doctrine that all political careers end in failure by leaving at a time of his choosing, which he did in late 2016. And it worked wonders for John Key, Sir John now, but it didn't work so well for his party. <laughs> um, because uh, the party, voters probably didn't differentiate enough whether it was John Key or the National Party. In the end, it was a third term government, and New Zealanders, after three terms, often say, well, that's probably enough, and we'll just give the other guys a chance, and especially if you've got a young, charismatic leader. And that was the parallel, really, between Jacinda Ardern and Kevin Rudd. Yeah. Uh, intriguingly, the National Party government won something like 7 to 8 percent more votes than the oppos opposition Labour Party. Uh, how then do you account for the fact that it actually lost power? Well, um, first of all, you have to realise that um, New Zealand has a really strange electoral system. Um, no wonder, because they took that from the Germans. <laughs> 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 I mean, you would never pick it up from my accent, of course. But, um, <laughs> so apologies for MMP, the electoral system. And this is the mixed and member proportional indeed. system. Indeed. Yep. So I always apologise for the electoral system and the war, of course. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing about MMP is um, it is unlike a first-past-the-post system where you can have clear winners and typically two parties. Under MMP, of course, everything is possible. So it is possible that the party with the strongest share of the vote still finds itself in opposition. So we have the situation now where the Labour Party and New Zealand First combined, so the two coalition partners, supported, of course, by the Greens, combined share of the vote is below nationals. Mm. And that's MMP. That's how the system works, because in the end, you need a parliamentary majority. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, Jacinta Ardern, to some extent, reminds you a bit of, uh, eerily, of Kevin from Brisbane uh, <laughs> in 2007, 10 years ago. How so? Well, it's not the most flattering comparison, of course, with Jacinda. Um, but if you just look at the election, um, and the election campaign in particular, it was an old government, uh, government that everybody knew after three terms, and there was this fresh face, and people could just project some hopes and aspirations to that fresh face, and, oh, okay, we might just give that person the go. Mm. I think there comes a time in democracy when people just get tired of the old and just want to try out something new. And I think Kevin, from Queensland or from Brisbane, perfectly captured that emotion and so did Jacinda Ardern. But I think that's where the parallels probably end, mm. because um, I haven't really met anyone yet who doesn't believe that Jacinda is a nice person. Yes, that's <laughs> Kevin Rudd wasn't. Yeah, But uh, I suppose the point here is that uh, she has no real experience. She's no ministerial experience like Kevin Rudd. And she has been praised by, among others, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. That doesn't seem to hurt her. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. I mean, there are plenty of other politicians who enter high office without any previous ministerial experience. I mean, John Key, for a start, didn't really have that either. John Key was still quite a rookie, actually, when he became prime minister. I wouldn't necessarily hold that against just in as a prime minister. Mm. But you're right. She never held office, and she is still very young, young of course, as a prime minister. 37, is that right? Indeed. Yep. Okay. Now, listen, let's turn to the question uh, that men would never get asked. Um, 60 Minutes uh, distinguished itself uh, this week by a controversial question that Charles Woolley asked uh, the prime minister. Uh, we haven't got footage of that, unfortunately, because of copyright reasons, but we have a version of that question. Can we go to it now? Right. It's a question about her pregnancy. Are we ready to go? Here we go. And we've been discussing today whether I'm allowed to ask it or not. <laughs> a lot of women in New Zealand feel like they have to make a choice between having babies yep. and having a career. Is that a decision that you yeah. feel you have to make or that you yeah. make feel you've already made?
<laughs> the question this is, and I think is a legitimate question for New Zealand because she could be the Prime Minister running this country. She has our best interests at heart, so we need to know these things. If you're an employer of a company, you need to know that type of thing from the women that you're employing. Oh. It's totally unacceptable in 2017 to say that women should have to answer that question in the workplace. Well, this is my that point. That is unacceptable. No, last night, yes. and I just went, <gasps> when he first said it, I found it inappropriate for a couple of reasons. First, this is her first day as leader of the opposition. It's her first prime time interview, and that's one of the first questions she's been asked. Well, that was during her time in opposition. Of course, it's been revealed in the last month or so that she is indeed expecting a child, I think, in July. And she was asked by Charles Woolley, um, who told the, the viewers of the 60 Minutes program that she was the most beautiful politician he'd ever laid eyes on. Uh, in some <laughs> it's Channel 9, not ABC. And uh, the second thing, of course, was he kept asking her about the time of conception. And then she was clearly a bit uncomfortable with this. How's this controversy playing out across the Tasman? Well, I think there's a bit of a backstory to that. Um, you have to take that into account. Um, Jacinda became deputy leader of the Labour Party early last year. And that was on the back of having won a, a constituency by election in Auckland, uh, where she didn't really face any opposition. She ran against just the Greens candidate. The National Party didn't even feel a candidate. And she got 80%. On, on that basis of this fantastic success, she became Labour's deputy leader. And of course, she was asked then, how ambitious are you? Is that the end of your career, or would you actually like to replace the current leader of the Labour opposition? And she tried to deflect the question and say, well, look, I'm quite not there yet, and I might want to have children and family at some stage. And that was basically her way of dodging the question, because everything else would have looked completely disloyal to her leader. So she brought it in a way upon herself that mm. people then, half a year later, when suddenly out of the blue, <laughs> Andrew Little resigned and she became the leader, people said, hang on, half a year ago you told us you weren't ready. <laughs> <laughs> and basically that's how it happened. Um, and actually in interviews afterwards she said, well, it was perfectly fine for, to, for people to ask me that question because yeah. I brought it upon myself. But then she said, of course, no other woman should be asked the same question. And um, mm. I think that's the backstory. story. And that's playing out well for her politically? It's playing out extremely well for yeah. her because it just contributes to her honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, last year, during the, uh, in the lead-up to the election campaign, one of Jacinta Ardern's Labour MPs got embroiled in a, a controversy across the Tasman here when uh, this uh, advisor, I think, an MP, uh, helped reveal the whole crisis or controversy over Barnaby Joyce's New Zealand citizenship. Well, that was the first Barnaby crisis, right? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> well, in the end, it didn't really damage anyone apart from Barnaby Joyce, maybe. But um, no, seriously, uh, Jacinda handled that really well. Julie Bishop overreacted. Julie and that's right, because Julie Bishop, the foreign minister, said she could not trust an Ardern Labour government, didn't she? Yes, and that was a bit of an own call, as it turned out. Um, but uh, <laughs> So I think Jacinda Ardern handled this extremely well. Uh, she uh, didn't really engage in a tit-for-tat with mm -hmm. the Australian um, foreign minister and uh, she kindly rebuked her own MP but actually it didn't even damage her own MP because he's just uh, become the Minister of Education so um, I, I think that was the te first test of her leadership and yeah. she really passed it with flying flags. Well let's talk about the the centre-right National Party they're now in opposition after having been in government uh, from 2008 to 2017 um, Bill English, uh, the long-time finance minister who then became tre uh, prime minister for the last year, he actually left parliament last week. On Tuesday today. this... Oh, on today, was it? Right, OK. Um, and today, or yesterday, I think, or was it Tuesday? Sometime this yep. week, the, the National Party uh, elected a new leader. Tell us about this new opposition leader, Oliver. Well, um, the new opposition leader is quite young, uh, 41, Simon. 41. So the Prime Minister of New Zealand is 37 and the opposition leader is 41. Yeah, it's a very young country, as you know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, he is very young, but that doesn't mean he's inexperienced because he was already a minister. He had some, some senior portfolios in the previous government. Um, we still have to see where he really stands in the great battle of ideas ideologically. Mm -hmm. He is a self-described classical liberal, as far as I understand. He attended um, CRS's Liberty and Society Is that a fact? 14 years ago. Right, there you go. There's yeah. an advertisement for the CIS. Yeah. Yes. Um, and now he will have to reposition the National Party. And he's already made some noises in the last few days about national having not played the housing crisis very well well good on him because i think that was one of the biggest problems for this national government and one of the reasons why they probably didn't win a higher share of the vote yeah when you say housing crisis you're you're mainly focusing on the largest city auckland where there there's been a huge increase in property value over the last 10 years correct yes uh, it is mainly an auckland problem but not just an auckland problem uh, across new zealand house prices are quite high mm. actually considering this is a country the size of the uk with a population of just under 5 million yeah. people. <laughs> right. And yet when you go to Auckland, um, you pay 10 times your median household income for a median house. So uh -huh. the benchmark for affordability is about three times. Well, during the campaign last year, Jacinta Ardern, one of her keynote policies was to slash immigration designed to take the pressure off uh, the housing market. Now, intriguingly, in the last week or so, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott is making the same pitch here that if you cut immigration, um, you'll ease pressures on infrastructure, overcrowding, and of course the housing market, taking the heat out of that. Is cutting immigration a good way of reducing property prices? Um, in theory, it might be, because if you don't have any migrants, of course you reduce demand in the housing market. There's no point denying that. The problem is, of course, you can't control migration that easily. And that actually leads me back to my CIS days. We argued back then, and I would still argue today in the New Zealand circumstances, that it is really, really difficult for any government to fine-tune migration. Because, let's face it, some migrants the country really needs. We've mm. got skills shortages. Do you want to cut them? Some migrants are students, of course, and we know that student is a big um, revenue earner, of course, for the country. So you wouldn't want to cut there. And some are just returning Kiwis, and you couldn't just send them back at the border. So, and Australians, by the way, too, this has become an increasingly attractive destination for Australians trying to find a better life. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> for all of these reasons, you can't fine-tune migration. Okay. And so for any politician promising a radical slashing of migration, that sounds very good in election campaigns, but you can't deliver it. I think I know the answer to this question, but I did ask the former New Zealand Prime Minister John Key last year on ABC's Radio National this question about the housing crisis in New Zealand. than you've had in the history of New Zealand before in terms of houses. So, yep, house prices have gone up. That is a genuine issue, and it's a genuine issue for particularly young people trying to get in the market. But you've got to remember with very low interest rates, for a lot of people, their average mortgage costs went down dramatically, even though they were having to borrow more. We have a housing crisis too, as you know, especially in Sydney and Melbourne. And mm. some economists, and this is an argument that uh, the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott is pushing, that if we cut immigration, that'll reduce demand for the housing market. How would you respond to well, that? Well, I think the answer is to increase supply. I mean, my personal view on migration, I know that there's this sort of anti-sort of globalisation, anti-trade rhetoric being pushed to a degree by Donald Trump, and that was certainly what was behind Brexit. But let me put this case to you. I was in Beijing last week. Okay, I think there are more people that live in Beijing than live in Australia. <laughs> Australia is a very big country. As a New Zealander, I know, when you fly over for six <laughs> hours, you're still on it. You know, it's a big place, right? Okay, so yes, of course, you've got to build the infrastructure to support all that. But here's this chance for Australia and New Zealand, two countries whose combined populations or whatever it is, 25, 28 million, to really attract some of the finest in the world. Mm. I mean, ask yourself this question as an Australian – are you going to get wealthier having access to two, three billion middle-income consumers around the world, attracting some of the finest mines from China, India, the United States, the UK, New Zealand, wherever, or are you going to get wealthy selling things to each other? The entire time I was PM, I just said, China's where the big game is, let's be blunt, and B, don't be afraid of migration. Don't be afraid of people coming in. Yep, get to pick and choose the people you want, but these people are adding a lot to our country and we should welcome them as long as they adopt our values and principles. Well, that's the former Prime Minister, John Key, with me on ABC Radio last year. Oliver. Well, I completely agree with John Key on that. 
Um, and I think, actually, if you look through the history of both countries, Australia and New Zealand, you can see that migration has actually benefited both countries enormously. I completely agree with the former Prime Minister. Not just uh, property prices, though. Clogged roads, infrastructure, overcrowding, health hospital problems. Well, this is what your critics would say in response to you and John Key. Yes, yes, but um, look at Australian history. I mean, when the first fleet arrived and um, they looked across Sydney Harbour, they didn't find any boats or hospitals or anything. They should have just turned around and went back to Britain. <laughs> right? um, this is not the mentality in which Australia was built, yeah. and this is not the mentality on which New Zealand was built. Of course, you require infrastructure, you require investment, and housing investment and roads and infrastructure and everything. Yeah. But that shouldn't stop us from accepting... So migration. your argument, I think this is the consensus view in the treasuries of both uh, the New Zealand and Australian governments, is that immigration cuts will actually uh, stunt uh, or slow down uh, economic growth. I think this is conventional view, and yes, yep. I think historically both countries, as I said, have benefited. Yeah. Now, in November, uh, the new Prime Minister, Jacinta Ardern, said that she did not regard the plight of detainees and Manus uh, and um, Nauru as acceptable, and she pledged to take 150 of them. Uh, Gerard Henderson, a columnist for the Australian newspaper, weighed into this issue, and he made the point that we can't take her seriously on this issue because in politics, scale matters, and New Zealand accepts only 750 refugees every year, whereas we, Australia, takes about 14,000 annually. Fair point? Fair point. And, um, I mean, let's face it, um, New Zealand is really hard to reach by boat. Um, <laughs> and for those who are trying to reach New Zealand by boat, there's over the Australian Navy and Coast Guard. Um, so I think it's very easy for any New Zealand Prime Minister to argue that we might just send a nice gesture and take 150 people, when in fact she knows that realistically she would never have to deal with the kinds of problems that Australia faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, let's talk about Ardern's economic uh, agenda. Um, the Australian newspaper in its editorial a few weeks ago said that already, quote, New Zealanders are being beset by bigger government, bigger spending and more taxes. And the Oz went on to say she is quickly dismantling the successful deregulation market reform agenda under Prime Ministers Key and English. Uh, how worried should we be about the New Zealand economy? Well, I like... Thank you. This microphone doesn't seem to work. I, I like the Australian newspaper and I greatly respect it, but I think on, on this occasion they're exaggerating a bit because really? so far I haven't seen my taxes going up. Going up. Um, mm. It hasn't happened. Yes, the Australian is right. Um, this government is probably leading us in the direction of bigger government because the government has already announced they wish to spend more at some stage. They have to pay for that too. Um, but I think this is too early to tell. Well, I think their argument though is that uh, tax cuts will be put off because uh, the Ardern government needs to spend money on you know, health and education, all these big spending commitments they made during the election campaign. How are they going to fund it? Uh, th that's true. That's a bit of a semantic discussion whether um, uh, tax cuts that were supposed to happen in the future that are now postponed mm -hmm. or taken off uh, count as a tax increase. But besides that, I mean, it is a mixed picture what that we're seeing with this current government. So some of the issues on which they are planning to spend more money, this is obviously money not spent too well. And I would say this, for example, on some provincial development that they're trying to do. I mean, think of your own nation building in the GFC. It's roughly like that. Mm. On other issues, take the housing market. I'm a bit more hopeful that we're probably going to see some reforms from this new government that we didn't get under the previous government. Even in education, where I'm very skeptical of the general direction of travel of this new government, there may still be some initiatives that are worth supporting. Right, right. But what about um, business confidence? I mean, the ANZ Business Outlook Survey shows declining business confidence in New Zealand. I mean, is there any danger of capital flight? Uh, business confidence has certainly gone down under this Labour government. Um, it's actually something that happens regularly when Labour gets elected. I mean, this is a historical phenomenon that happens mm. every time. The thing is, actually, if you look at the previous government, the previous government campaigned as a centre-right government and governed pretty much as a centrist government. This new government campaigned as a centre-left government or centre-left opposition, but I think there is still a chance they might end up also a centrist government. So I think take the exaggerations out of the picture, we might actually see a government that will in the end not be too dissimilar from what we've seen in the past. Think mm. of Helen Clark. Mm, that's right. Well, on that note, um, is uh, Jacinta Ardern more a disciple of Helen Clark's interventionist economic pro-regulatory agenda, 
or is she more likely to be like Roger Douglas and David Longy, the New Zealand uh, Labor reformers in the 1980s and 1990s? Before you answer that, I think just for those of you who don't know much about New Zealand politics, here's an economic primer. The, um, the Longy government uh, from 1984 until the late 80s, early 90s, uh, like the Hawke government here, although they were Labor governments, they did push through a radical free market reform agenda. And that reform agenda was continued by Ruth Richardson, the finance minister in the national government in the 1990s, a former chair, uh, a former board of director here at the Centre for Independent Studies. Let's hear from Ruth Richardson. This is her explanation uh, for the free market revolution in New Zealand. Revolution. Well, the millennials would understand disruption. Hmm. And this was disruption meeting politics only in the late 80s, early 90s. And I went into politics to conduct a free market insurgency. Hmm. Uh, it was about a status quo that was discredited. And uh, I wanted to be an activist in the cause of liberating uh, the economy and securing a basis of freedom as the principle that would drive all policy. And the really interesting thing was that my party had been more meddling, more socialist than any socialist party. And Sir Roger Douglas, who was the first reforming minister, mm -hmm. uh, had been socialist in his DNA and by birth. He was Labour, you were national. Yes. He and, was and officially left, you were officially right. In, in theory, but my party had deviated in favour of socialism and he led radical market reform. So we had a, an mm. era where philosophical deviancy was the norm. <laughs> we, we both uh, stepped outside uh, what had been the uh, approach. from I think 1990 to the mid-90s. As I mentioned before, she was a former member, board member here at CIS. Um, it's interesting because uh, in the 80s, uh, and a lot of Americans are astonished by this, the Longy government was bagging Reaganism, but at the same time embracing, if you like, Reaganomics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And um, that was the movement of the time, of course. And you had Hawke and Keating, and there was Margaret Thatcher. We shouldn't forget her sure. either. Uh, these were different times. Today, in New Zealand politics, and probably in Australian politics too, you wouldn't really find anyone like Ruth Richardson or Roger Douglas. And how do you account for that? I think the times have changed. Um, I, I think we have all become more incrementalist, uh, less radical, less ideological. I think you Not in really Britain with Jeremy Corbyn. Well, that's the exception to the rule. <laughs> And in a strange kind of way, even as a free market here, I find this refreshing because I think I would like to see these old debates sometimes. I would like to have people who you could wake up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., ask them, what do you believe in? And they could tell you without having to ask a focus group. Mm. Um, mm. It would be mm. nice. Right. Yeah. Um, these politicians don't seem to exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Is the widespread consensus in New Zealand that those controversial reforms that Longy, Douglas and Richardson put in place have made New Zealand a better place? I think this is a controversial issue, and I actually remember having lots of discussions with Greg Lindsay about that. Uh, My predecessor here at CIS. Yep. Um, and he, of course, played a role in this from Sydney, um, because the CIS was, of course, also active in New Zealand. Um, and he had the direct contrast between what happened here in Australia and what happened in New Zealand. Greg always told me, from his perspective, the Australian reforms were much more accepted because they were better communicated and they were kind of um, the country was taken with them. Mm. Whereas in New Zealand, it had to happen much quicker because the country was in dire straits. And therefore, you could never really build the complete constituency to carry them um, through. You didn't have the kind of support in the commentariat. You mm. didn't have an Australian newspaper. And therefore, there was m the support for the reforms was shallower. And yeah. it was dependent on a few people, on my predecessor in, in New Zealand, on Roger Kerr. Yep. Um, uh, head of Ruth the Richards New Zealand Business Roundtable. Indeed. Yep, for three decades. Ruth Richardson, Roger Douglas, but it was not the kind of movement that actually grabbed the whole nation and um, got deeper roots. Yeah. And that probably made it easier for Prime Minister Helen Clark to increase the size and the scope of the government in Wellington, which subsequently became known as what Helen Grad during the uh, nineteen <laughs> during the 90, late nineties, early to, to early to mid two thousands. Um, John Key, of course, as Prime Minister, pushed a lot of reforms, and he maintained his popularity. 
How on earth did he do that? Because Malcolm Turnbull would argue privately that it's hard to push reform and keep popularity levels high. Well, I actually wrote an essay about it um, after his uh, second term when he won um, the third, um, and it was called, called Quiet Achievers. And my thesis at the time was uh, that he only managed to introduce radical reforms by doing it in a, at an incremental speed. Right. So he was um, preparing the country, taking the country with him, and then implementing the stuff gradually so that in the end hardly anyone noticed that reforms were taking place. Uh, I did write this, of course, for my good friend Nick Cater, who is with us tonight. The Menzies Research, Menzies Research, Research Centre. Uh, and um, Nick, I must say, in hindsight, I have some regrets about that publication <laughs> because it gave key license to be even slower in the third <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think he took this as encouragement that everything was fine and now he could basically stop and just enjoy his popularity. And the third term for National was a wasted opportunity. So maybe I shouldn't have written this, or maybe I should have waited another term. Um, but I think this is the only chance you have to get decent reforms through. You have to communicate them. You have to build a constituency. You have mm. to make the case for them. Then you've got a chance. But you can't just impose them on a the country and then expect the population to go with you. That doesn't work. Yeah, Oliver, I remember about 10 years ago, the wage gap, the trans-Tasman wage gap, New Zealand and Australia, was something like 30 to 34, 35%. What is it now? Hard to tell because I don't trust the statistics. Um, <laughs> um, our former Reserve Bank of New Zealand Governor Alan Bollard always said that um, he didn't trust the statistics because he thought New Zealanders are just more careful in what they measure. So not everything that is produced in New Zealand automatically becomes part of GDP. And then he said in the Australians, they calculate everything into it. Uh -huh. So he thinks that you guys systematically overestimate how much you produce and we systematically underestimate it and in practice it probably isn't much of uh -huh. a difference. My own experience is actually, I think it is hardly noticeable the difference between the two countries. Right, right. What about uh, New Zealand immigration to Australia because that was growing at a rapid rate in the 90s and, and, and 2000s. Has that changed much in the last few years? Oh, radically. Um, John Key um, campaigned in opposition um, in front of um, Westpac Stadium in Wellington and said, well, this is the equivalent of the population we lose every year to Australia. That has to Jeez. stop. Wow. And it did stop. So actually, we currently run a slight surplus migration with Australia. When I moved across the Tasman in 2012, people asked me, why, who in his right mind would leave Sydney for Wellington? And there must be something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that really well. Um, my first day in the country, I arrived in an empty flat with an empty fridge, went to the next supermarket and stocked up on stuff. And this young cashier, scan my stuff and, um, and then she said, oh, there's a lot of stuff that you've got. I hope you've got a flyboys card. And I said, I've got a flyboys card, but it wouldn't be much use here. I said, why not? I said, it's an Australian flyboys card. Why would you have an Australian flyboys card? And I said, I just moved here, I arrived today. And then she scanned my stuff and told me, you've made the worst choice of your life and we would move to Wellington and it's terrible, terrible, terrible. And while she gave him my change, she said, whatever you do in New Zealand, get yourself a flyboys card at least. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I've moved countries before. I've, I've never had this kind of strange welcome. But that was the mindset in 2012 when New Zealand actually lost 30,000 people net to Australia every year. And I think this is one of John Key's best achievements as Prime Minister. He gave the country its confidence back. So at the end of uh, the national government and at the end of Key's term, um, we are running a surplus with Australia. And I think this is not least due to the fact that Key actually made New Zealand popular again and made it confident of itself mm. again because that confidence when I moved there simply wasn't there because I heard similar remarks from people when I arrived who, who would actually leave Australia for mm. New Zealand and now even the Australian High Commissioner when he retired decided to settle in New Zealand. Wow, <laughs> fascinating, yeah. And that's not to mention the fact that uh, New Zealand have won the, the last two World Cups in rugby as well, right? Well, we have better wines too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I used to say like 10 years ago, I, I have many New Zealand friends but they all live in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> and we shouldn't even start talking about Pavlova. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it true that Australia owns half of New Zealand? I think that is a gross exaggeration. <laughs> I think <laughs> the um, statistic you refer to probably is um, Australia's share in New Zealand's uh, foreign direct investment. And of all yep. foreign direct investment in New Zealand, which I think should be more, by the way, Australia currently holds about 50% of that. Okay. Well, you know, mind you, who owns major Australian beer brands? Well, yes, uh, we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> now, listen, uh, we'll wrap it up before we go to questions. I want to talk a bit about cultural change. 
because CIS is interested in not just the economic debates and the education debates and the indigenous debates, but we're very interested in the cultural issues. And two years ago, the Conservative Prime Minister, John Key, pushed the idea of a New Zealand flag. Um, and um, his argument was that uh, the New Zealand flag, obviously, looks a lot like the Australian flag. I thought it was <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the British comedian, John Oliver, taking the mickey out of the then New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key. Unsurprisingly, this has caused some problems in the past. There's just a huge confusion factor. So I can tell you as Prime Minister, the number of times I walk over to something and they, I'm in an international meeting and they sit me down in, in front of the Australian you know, flag or the Australian area, it's, you know, it's not funny, it happens all the time. <laughs> oh, it is funny and that's why it happens all the time. <laughs> Put him under the Australian flag. He gets so, I, I want to hear him say flig. Make him say flig. <laughs> <laughs> John Oliver taking the mickey out of John Key. The flag proposal that John Key pushed lost. You're Why? <laughs> well, um, I think John Key made a strategic mistake. Um, if he had made it a non-partisan issue, if he had taken the Labour opposition on board, because Labour actually wanted to change the flag, remember, um, then he would have had a chance to get it through. So it wasn't bipartisan then? No, it was John Key's pet project. He wanted to change the flag. So he you're saying that Labour opposed these efforts because Labor didn't it was a conservative idea? Labour didn't support Key's flag referendum idea, and um, which is ironic because yeah. typically it's the left of politics That's that right. wants to change the flag yeah. and the right of politics that wants to maintain it. I mean, supposedly conservative parties. Um, Key made it his own pet project. He wanted to leave it as a legacy, or at least that was the impression the country got. And naturally, of course, everybody who didn't vote national was automatically <laughs> then against this flag proposal. Had Key handled it the other way around, I think um, we pro probably would have gotten a new flag. Yeah. And by the way, we all too often know that New Zealand, the, the New Zealand flag gets mixed up with the Australian flag, but it goes both ways. When Prime Minister Hawke, little known fact, went to Montreal in Canada in 1984 at the tarmac. There were all these New Zealand flags to greet him. But <laughs> anyway, it was the wrong idea anyway, because um, <laughs> Sir John had introduced knighthoods, of course, just a few years before, thus re-establishing links with the United Kingdom. And at the same time that you are kind of linking back to your history, then to say, well, out of the blue, we're changing the flag now, we're getting rid of the Union Jack, to me, it was ahistoric. Mm. So it doesn't really make sense. Either you really want to start fresh and you may become a republic and you then really find something new, or you just leave it. Yeah. Because what's the point changing a flag? I mean, countries change flags after significant events. When they lost the war, happened to us before. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> when you give yourself a new, when y for good reasons, when you give yourself a new constitution, when you do something significant, you want to make sure there is a symbol for that. Yes. But in New Zealand's case, actually nothing happened. In fact, we were going back to more of the British roots and then to change the flag. It just and, and we should sense. also remember, Key was a strong monarchist and uh, he reintroduced knighthoods. Is that correct? Well, yeah, exactly, precisely. So you can't really combine the two. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, listen. Question. Anyone? Nick Cater from the Menzies Research Centre. Just wait for the mic. Thank you, Tom. Th thank you, Oliver, for throwing such um, uh, a good perspective on New Zealand as you always do. Uh, I don't think you need to feel too bad about your uh, quiet achievers because you did point out, I think, in that monograph uh, very strongly that, that you suspected there were limits to incremental reform that you would never ever get round to doing something like the New Zealand pension system because it's too big. I wonder if you care to reflect on that in the light of what uh, uh, the problems that the coalition government's having over company tax. You know, it looks, it's having almost trouble getting very small change through on company tax. Uh, and there's a suggestion of field that maybe if they bought a, a you know, be more ambitious and done a, a larger scale reform of the tax system uh, there would have been scope for pay, you know, to trade off one against another, uh, and that this very sort of limited ambition means that they're sort of destined to failure now. That they ought to go back to that. Do you think one, there's anything in that theory, and two, is there any hope we we ever get back to some serious large-scale reform? Well, um, it's probably in my DNA, but I still hate to be gloomy. Um, um, it, I really struggle to see any decent reform movement happening in Australia anytime soon. Um, and I don't know what happened to the country, really. When I first um, 
came to Australia in 1999 and then I studied here 2001. This country was on the move. Stuff was happening and you felt a certain degree of optimism. But basically since the end or, or the last term maybe of the Howard um, government and then certainly under Rudd and everything that happened afterwards, um, the country has, I think, f in terms of policy reform, at least lost its mojo. And I think there are no communicators making a coherent case for reform. You have great ideas coming out of the CIS and probably also the IPA and, of course, the Menzies Research Center. So you guys are doing a fantastic job, but how do you actually create an atmosphere in which politicians would actually like to run with these ideas and make them theirs and then convince the public? I have no answer for that. I'm, I'm really puzzled actually what happened to Australia because when, when I grew up, I looked at countries like Australia and New Zealand in the stale Helmut Kohl years in Germany and I thought, well, these countries are doing stuff and why don't we do that? And now if you've become like that. Uh, Luke Malpass, who's a, a former a colleague of ours at the Centre for Independent Studies, uh, he did our new, he had our New Zealand project. He now writes leaders for the Financial Review. Luke, and a former colleague at the Initiative. That's right, indeed. I'm sorry, I missed um, I missed most of your talk. Sorry, Oliver. Um, look, I, I suppose. There was a real sense by the end of the English government that it had run out of puff a little bit, um, and I and it seemed that there were hopes that if uh, Mr. English had won the election, that they were going to kind of get back on the on the reformist agenda. Now, with the change in government, do you see that there's uh, that there's a kind of a uh, a new energy and they're actually changing direction, or do you think that? really it's a bit more of the same kind of plodding um, almost corporatism that had sort of crept in by the end of particularly John Key's uh, period as Prime Minister. You're talking just about the National Party now? Sorry? No, <laughs> no, 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 now I'm talking about the government. Okay. So, I mean, they're, obviously they're new and they have their own sort of mm. platform, but do, are we looking at sort of a continuation of the same? Because in some ways they're elected on being the same and different. It was almost, I think you wrote a piece for the Financial Review saying that it was really the Kevin 07 type, yeah. type vibe. So, yes. Yeah. This new government um, at the same time is incredibly activist. Um, you should just look at the press releases they're putting out on a daily basis or you look at cabinet papers on education reform. This is full of ambition. They really want to do stuff. <laughs> There's commission after commission on problem definitions and summits. It's all scheduled now. So this government actually has the same, same kind of reformist zeal that Kevin Rudd perhaps had in his first couple. the New Zealand equivalent of our One Nation Party led by Pauline Hanson. It's pretty interventionist, um, anti-immigration, pro-regulation, agrarian socialist almost. Um, how on earth can that agenda work with a reformist government? Well, I would first say that the comparison between um, One Nation and New Zealand First and between Pauline Hanson and Winston Peters is a little bit unfair. Really? I'm just not sure on whom. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> New Zealand First is a strange kind of party because um, it is led, of course, by Winston Peters and... Uh, Who, incidentally, is actually speaking at the Lowy Institute tonight, but I suspect it's a better performance. To be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, look, um, I think Winston is not the most ideological politician, which is a nicer way of saying that he just cares for increasing his electoral share and uh, probably cares for a few offices along the way as well. <laughs> um, so I think it is a little bit unfair perhaps to put him in the same camp as Pauline Hanson. That's a different kind right. of party. Um, and with Pauline Hanson, I certainly see more of a populist streak about it um, and more extremism. Um, Winston Peters is still seen within the New Zealand context as a respectable politician with whom a Labour Party even can form a coalition government. And I think no party in Australia, correct me if I'm wrong, would actually fancy that thought of formally 
mm. uh, finding any kind of coalition with Pauline Hanson. And we should remember this week, indeed, Pauline Hanson came out to oppose the cuts to company tax cuts. Any other questions? Um, yes, sir. Yep. Um, as an example of reform, I'm just wondering what you're hearing around in Wellington on, firstly, the um, RBNZ review, the act of re review of the RBNZ Act, including an employment mandate, and secondly, we also have a new RBNZ governor coming in late this month. How do you think he'll be able to respond to that? Um, you know, the, the politics around you know potentially changing RBNZ and yeah. you know just general management of the central bank. Oh, questions for policy connoisseurs. Um, the RBNZ mandate, a um, bit of a background. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, New Zealand monetary policy, so our Reserve Bank has a commitment to price stability that's in its mandate. The Labour government, um, or Labour Party in opposition, campaigned on changing the mandate. They wanted to include employment as a target. And um, if you ask any economist, um, you probably find 100% agreement that there is no conflict between employment and price stability. And a reserve bank ideally should focus on just price stability and employment will just follow automatically. Now, having campaigned on that, of course, they have to deliver. And so the question in Wellington is, basically, how can we make this happen without damaging the goal of price stability? So I think what we'll, we will likely see in the end is some kind of formula which will say that the Reserve Bank should aim to achieve full employment subject to achieving price stability. So it won't change anything in the long run, but it will allow the Labour Party to say it has done something. On the second question, the new governor, um, we'll have to see. Aidan Orr, the new governor, comes from the um, uh, super fund. Uh, highly respected, very well versed in financial markets. Um, I think a, a very good choice to be the next Reserve Bank Governor. The more interesting question, I think, and it's certainly a question from the perspective of the New Zealand Initiative, is how can we perhaps change the structure of the Reserve Bank beyond monetary policy because it, is a, it has a dual function, unlike Australia, where it is also a regulator of financial markets. And in, in this role, I think the current setup of the Reserve Bank deserves a lot more criticism than the current setup for monetary policy. Yes, sir. Quite, quite often people ask me uh, questions about New Zealand, although I haven't been there for about 20 years. And I always say that, of course, they can do it. Everything about New Zealand makes sense for one reason. They don't have an upper house. The person mm. that's elected to run the that's country point. can get on with it. It's a great point. And we yeah. can't. We've got a country where we have an upper house. Its main function is to make sure nothing gets through. Mm. Um, I, I still believe we should dump our Senate and, mm. and appoint some people to check a few regulatory rules. But um, do you think that's relevant with New Zealand not have not having an upper house? Uh, or as Paul Keating said, the Senate was unrepresentative swill. <laughs> I tend to disagree on that point um, because New Zealand may not have an upper house, but we have all the complexities that result from an upper house in our unicameral but, but isn't system. Isn't it easier to pass legislation though without an upper no, house? We, we, we have MMP. We have mixed member proportional. We have this stupid German electoral system which replicates the upper house in the lower house. So really. I am actually yeah. a great fan of bicameralism, and my ideal system, believe it or not, is the UK House of Lords. Not representative all, not democratic, not accountable to anyone, but with, filled with good people who actually understand legislation and often make it better. It's a bugger to think they do it on talent. Yes. But bear in mind, the Queensland doesn't have a Senate or an upper house. But we can talk about that later. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Hartwich, can I ask you just to explain this MMP? Because I think most of us don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <coughs> well, okay, let's put it this way. Um, MMP has been in operation in Germany for almost 70 years now. And if you poll the Germans, about half of them still don't get it either. <laughs> Um, New Zealanders are marginally more intelligent than Germans, so they've got a better chance. <laughs> <laughs> but the basic idea is that you have two votes. With the first vote, you vote for a constituency candidate, and there it's first past the post. The person who gets the most votes in a constituency gets a seat in parliament. But the second vote determines the total composition of parliament. So there you vote for parties, and then the total makeup of the house depends on that second vote. And the constituency mandates, one, are calculated against that. So it is possible then to vote for 
a candidate you like, you personally know, you respect, no matter which party that candidate comes from, while still voting for your preferred par party as the total composition vote. Now, um, that would require people to actually understand how the system works, and I think that's where it gets complicated. But the real implication of MMP is not so much in the operation of um, how voters may think it works. The problem is actually, if you're under an FPP, as a, uh, as a first past the post system, you typically end up with two party systems. So you have one party in opposition and one party in government, and you always know who governs you. And also, of course, a party may campaign on a certain platform, gets elected, then has to implement it. Once you actually move away from the system, you end up with loads of smaller parties. And then, of course, it requires coalition forming after the election, negotiations. And so, classic example, my favorite example of MMP, in Germany a few years ago, um, the um, CDU campaigned on a GST increase of 2%. The SPD, the Social Democrats, said, no, this is just outrageous. This would be unfair on low-income earners. The two ended up in coalition, and GST went up by... 3%. Wow. Jeez. And both parties could say, well, yeah, you know, that's what happens. I mean, we had coalition negotiations as an MP. What do you expect? And is this is degree of uh, a lack of accountability. I think that makes MMP really hard to stomach. One final question. Um, yes, sir. Yep. Well, you um, said that you would like to find a politician that you could wake up at three in the morning and ask him what he believed. Well, there is one in the Australian Parliament today who will give you the answer at three in the morning. That's David Lionhelm. <laughs> Thank you. That's a comment. We'll get one more question. Yes, sir, I think you want to ask a question. We'll just wait for the mic, mate. Yes. Yeah, uh, Chris Sundstrom. Um, I'm interested in the early immigration history into New Zealand. Uh, in particular, the uh, company that selected immigrants from the UK and brought them to New Zealand. And I have this sort of... Uh, I have this sort of uh, vague feeling that there's a level of creativity in New Zealand that's absent in this country. And I just wonder if you think that the, the zeitgeist, perhaps, is... Uh, is uh, uh, can can be found by going back to that to that original mm. settling in New Zealand. Well, where I would probably concur with you is that there is certainly a lot of creativity in New Zealand, and there is also a mentality to just make things work with limited means. Sometimes um, number eight wire mentality is celebrated in New Zealand, not so much anymore. But actually, I mean more recent days, look at um, some great successes. I mean, New Zealand has built a fantastic wine industry, actually become the second largest wine exporter to the United States now, believe it or not. Um, we ha established um, a great company in Zero, for example, in okay. Wellington. So I think there is still creativity, whether you can trace it back to the people who arrived 100 or 150 years ago, or whether it isn't just a genuine creativity of people currently living in New Zealand, I would probably err on the side of the latter. Ladies and gentlemen, that just about wraps it up. But before we conclude, um, I want to say the CIS is very lucky to have a group of uh, distinguished entrepreneurs and self-made men and women who are on our board. Uh, one of them uh, is going to give our vote of thanks, and that's Chris Roberts. Chris. Oh, thank you. By the way, speaking, is this, does this work? Maybe I don't need it. I don't know. Um, Speaking of MMP, by the way, my understanding always was that MMP was actually imposed on Germany by the Allies during the settlement after the Second World War. And the reason it was Im imposed was to ensure <coughs> that nothing like the Third Reich or could ever happen again. In other words, if nothing could, the, you couldn't run the place. And, <laughs> and, the, and, and I think that pretty much has happened. Um, and how the New Zealanders voted for it, knowing or perhaps not knowing that history, who knows? But look, I'm not here to speak about MMP. <laughs> but uh, obviously Oliver's disagreeing with me, I think. But it's great to have Oliver back here. I mean, he, uh, he always brought terrific perspective and, and forensic analysis on just about everything. I've actually just come back from New Zealand today. I went there about eight days ago and with my wife and we went there to taste the wine and I could talk to you about wine by the way. New Zealanders produce very good Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. Yeah. We in Australia produce very good Cabernet Shiraz and, um, and, and uh, 
Chardonnay. And the reason they're different is that different climates. It's as simple as that. But anyway, the, what I was going to say is we went to New Zealand to fish and play a bit of golf and taste the wine. And uh, one of the great things about going to New Zealand eight or ten days ago was we were escaping. We were going to a Barnaby-free zone, we thought. <laughs> now, at this point, I'm going to have to tell you that that wasn't actually the case. Because when I got there, the first thing I did was went out and bought the local paper in central Otago because we went to the south. You'll have to hold this. Sure. I think I can read this to you because I've got a loudish voice. Page three. You always go to page three. <laughs> <laughs> let, me t let me tell you. I'd like to come home. This is the uh, Barnaby Joyce's open letter to Jacinda Ahern. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts, Dear Jacinda, Firstly, my hearty congratulations on the news that you're expecting a child in a few months' time. We have much in common. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I will be welcoming the pitter-patter of a little one by mid-year too. Indeed, I envy the response your country has had to your news. Mine has not been, mine has not been quite so celebratory. And that brings me to this letter, one I'm writing to you as a citizen of New Zealand for almost my entire life, <laughs> until, until only a matter of a few months ago. It was during a state of confusion that I renounced my homeland, and I implore you to consider the evidence I offer and intervene to have my renouncement renounced. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't give us any perspective on this, Oliver, and it's something that I think Oliver missed out on, actually. But look, it's, it's my position to thank uh, Oliver. You've done a terrific job tonight. We, I mean, to, to understand what's going on in New Zealand is always a challenge, but you've done it. And uh, I, I know many people in New Zealand who regard the work you've done there very, very highly, so congratulations on that. But thanks very, very much for coming tonight. And... Uh, we look forward to seeing you again, particularly after Jacinda's been in charge for two or three years. I think there'll be a lot to yeah. learn, <laughs> possibly. But thanks very much. Yeah. Great. Chris, thank Chris, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, that just about does it for us uh, this evening. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. One, as a, I don't want to sound like a pub bore, but uh, we survive because of the generosity of people like yourselves. So if you haven't become a member of CIS, there's a membership form there. Please consider joining us. Lots of good things you get out of it. And uh, the next event will be on Tuesday night in this room. Uh, it's a debate about Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India. Uh, today we had some figures in India, 7.4% economic growth fo forecasts for this year based on the last quarter. So already India is surpassing China's growth rate. I don't think for what it's worth we in this country do enough on Indian politics and Indian foreign policy. And Narendra Modi is a fascinating character in so many ways. We're going to have a great debate about Modi and India here on Tuesday night. Hope to see you then. Till next time, all the best. Thank you so much. And thank you, Oliver. That was great, mate. Very good. Well.